Hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, Lucy to uh, arrange all the things. I'm Shizia Yang from Chinese Academy of Science, uh, based on the Institute of Vertebrate Paleoanthropology and Paleoanthropology. Uh, I think uh, most of my audience online, online now uh, just had your lunch, or maybe having your lunch in front of your PC. But here in Beijing, we are already late in the evening. Just like uh, today, we are living in different locations uh, of the world. Uh, the early, uh, early harmonians, uh, when they dispersed into different parts of the world, they must uh, face in very different uh, habitat. Um, so then they have, uh, then they should have different, uh, very varied uh, behavioral adaptations. Okay, at least they have, they, they cannot see the sun rays at the same time. Uh, like uh, I have been working in the paleo, uh, paleo uh, linguistic archaeology in Eastern Asia, especially in North and Northeast China uh, for the past 10 years. Um, during the 10 years, I have also uh, traveled just, uh, and exchanged the three years in Western Europe, have the opportunities uh, to see some uh, sites in the other side of the world and also have the time to have some opportunities to check the uh, collaborations in different uh, museum and laboratory. I can feel that although we're in the particular the time period, uh, we have similar avail the the old harmonians have the similar uh, abilities, but uh, in the different part of the world, they really show the very different behavioral adaptations, if, like the different kind of stone tools. So today, I'm very happy to share the recent years' work I and my colleagues did together in North and Northeast China. Now I will begin with uh, the early and the middle Pleistocene uh, sites in the Nihuan Basin. We begin the cooperative the project uh, from 1916 when I begin my postdoctor in the Institute of Geology and Geo uh, Geophysics. Uh, Professor Chen Longdeng and Professor Michael Paglia, they are very nice scientists, also very important supervisors for my career. So we worked uh, for the Niho One project for almost five years by now. Okay, this is the landscape of Niho One Basin for you who have never been here. It's good to have this overview of the, of the basin. This basin is very important uh, for the archaeology research for Eastern Asia. It's uh, it contains a very long sequence through the lower Paleolithic until to the Neolithic. When you see the basin, you see this very thick the castrins the castrins uh, This is when we move the very close to the site. As and in this site, in this basin, we have some famous early Pleistocene sites like Majengo, which published it, uh, on Nature, I think, in 2001 or two. I forgot the exactly uh, year uh, when they first published the date 1.6 million years. It became the oldest site in Eastern Asia. And also, this basin containing so many early Pleistocene sites. It's called uh, uh, like cradles of uh, human evolution for Eastern Asia. I just to show some uh, have uh, show some uh, images uh, from Majin Go site. Uh, it's uh, it's not only have the artifact but also have some fauna uh, fauna uh, fauna uh, remains. Uh, we have. I think some uh, detailed work on the zoo archaeology is taking on now. So maybe in the near future, you will see some clear card marks or some showing out. So then we uh, I'm happy to share this. So this is a 3D model we did, when, uh, I think in 2019. Uh, 
actually when people you were really talking about New Hawaiian Basin, they focus on the small area in the northeastern part of the basin, as this area have all the famous early Pleistocene sites. But in fact, in this whole big basin, what are composed of three small basins, the Yangyan Basin, Yijian Basin, and the Datong Basin. In this whole big basin, there have sites from the different stage and cover the whole uh, Whole, uh, whole Paleolithic and the Neolithic state, stage. To, uh, to give a good overview of the uh, archaeology of this basin, we have uh, done a pr very primary uh, like review work. Um, uh, it's published in the evolutionary anthropology. Uh, here you can clearly see the site from early Pleistocene to the late Pleistocene. Yeah, Niho One is not only famous for famous and important research area for archaeologists, it also very uh, good target for the paleontologist. I think um, some of you must know the uh, Niho One fauna. It's uh, the represented typical fauna of uh, Eastern Asia for early Pleistocene. So in this uh, review paper, we put together the climate, the global climate background, the, the change of vegetation and the change of the fauna. Uh, this is the data of the basin. The fauna is, the, <coughs> is also based on, based on the basin and also the archaeological data of the basin. We can generally see that uh, the densities and the number of the artifacts changed through the uh, Pleistocene stage. In the, uh, at the transition stage from the early to the middle Pleistocene, we have a peak of the density of the artifact, and then move to the middle of the to the to the middle state of Pleistocene. It there seems to be a gap. It does not mean that there is nothing uh, in the basin. It's just a very low density of artifact. Then it came to another peak to at the beginning of the late Pleistocene. So we have a general review of the artifact. I, I have picked some or picked up some uh, typical sites and typical artifacts uh, from different stage. In early Pleistocene, you can see some very well retouched small tools can be clearly distinguished by the types. And then into the middle Pleistocene, things got to a little bit simplified for the tools and for the reduction sequences. Yes, there is still some like a well faceted platform or some things, but most of the uh, site shows a very low density of artifacts and the roughly retouch. When moved to the late Pleistocene, so the New Holland population seemed to want to catch up with the development uh, route. So uh, we developed a very well artifacts, which we have seen so maybe in some middle paleo, middle, uh, middle paleolithic archaeological sites in Europe, well retouched the scrapers uh, and when moving the end of the late Pleistocene, we have the end scrapers, furans, and some arrow hand. And we also got the nice bone needles, maybe some, some kind of the uh, bone beads, maybe for the arch, for the ornament or something. So to the very end of the late Pleistocene, we got a nice microblade. So it's, uh, we can see it's rich in both early and the late Pleistocene. So my current studies, uh, I mean the published ones are mainly on the uh, technological innovation at the transition between the early to middle Pleistocene. So as uh, when we have seen some general drawings of the artifact here, we have a very clear photo to show how the early tools look like. We have, uh, we have this uh, very nice notched tools and also this kind of uh, 
pointed like things, very, yeah, uh, very surprising for me to see this because this artifact can date it back to uh, one million years. So we also do some uh, technological comparisons about the reduction techniques, uh, uh, like uh, the types of the flake and the platform and the, the size and the many, many other things. We get the sense that uh, uh, it's changing from the early and to the onset of the middle Pleistone phase. Pe people in Nihon Basin got better controlling to uh, producing, produced the, the small flake, like this cross, uh, like uh, turning and retraining for many times to get good angles, to flaking out very small one, small flake, like this kind of flake, only uh, smaller than two centimeters. And uh, we also compared the tools with some early Site, Xiao Changliang, this is it's 1.3 to 1.4 million years. And this is from Dongwu to and Sun Jia Wan. Uh, as you think in the extra photos, it's uh, around 1.1 1 .1 to 1, uh, 1 million years. Like this is a much fine retouches compared to the early one. And the types of the tools can be better identified. So later we, we, we do a general uh, review of the whole development sequence in the basin and out of the basin. So also compare linked it to, to the uh, evolution, uh, the, uh, the physical evolutionary history of humans, like the brain size, how it's changing. We also can see in the middle Pleistone, say, onset of the middle, the, <clears throat> uh, the brain science began to changing roughly uh, very quick, very quickly. Although there's in Nihon Basin, we do not have any early or uh, early uh, Pleistone, say, uh, homonians uh, evidence uh, like uh, any bones, but uh, the evidence from Lantian. Uh, the Gong Wang Ling uh, can give us uh, uh, like an indicator how this uh, how during this period the physical uh, evidence like in China and we also see the landscape are changing and uh, so we see this uh, change from ecology biological and the linguistic data so this broke up the long staying statement that in Eastern Asia, the linguistic technology kept, kept simple for a long time. No, it's not kept simple. It's how changing and it's got very various during uh, as early as one million years ago during the transition between the early to middle Pleistone. So when we finish the work in Nihon Basin, we take it broader to uh, out of the basin, this is the background of uh, of the of the stratigraphy, the, like the chronological uh, of the Chinese May sediments, uh, very famous like the Lurs Mantle. So at the beginning, we I we just uh, talking about that why there is no uh, not a lot of publications or archaeological evidence from Eastern Asia. In fact, we have a very long sequence like deposit of the continent. So there we have the in the future, we have the possibility to get more evidence. But when we reviewed what we have by now, we get already some basic knowledge about can see the changing of the um, distribution of the site from the pre-MPT, pre the pre-MPT. Uh, in the early stage, early stage, we can only some some points here and there, uh, especially clustered in the Nihon Basin, and uh, the other area is uh, in the center of the Lurs Plateau. Uh, in 2018, we published the Shangchen site, 
in fact, it's a long sequence from the 1.5 million year to the 2.1 million years, the early, uh, very early sites there, and then in Hawaii. Uh, some site in South, but uh, it's quite uh, uh, quite a lot of discussion about this site. Like UMO, we have only two uh, homonian teeth, and in Longupo, it's uh, really a long story. But when we turn the middle uh, onset of the middle Pleistocene, we have more sites in both Nihawan Basin and also in the central China, the south part of the uh, Lurch Plateau, and also have the famous uh, Pandex site uh, in both by the Bursa Basin. <laughs> but uh, in the post MPT time, the population moved more south. This is uh, what we get in the conclusion of our our paper. In the when the middle Pleistocene, say when the climate in the north part get more harsh, people moved more south, and uh, so we can clear say in these pictures the popular uh, the site densities of uh, South China and North China changed at the point of MPT. Before MPT, we have more sites in North China and afterward the site, the number of the sites in South China growing up very quickly. And, if, uh, and also we have this conclusion that I think this is uh, just based on the current data. I can imagine in the future 10 years that we will have more data and enrich the, the, uh, the, uh, the structures we have now. So like uh, uh, here, we can see the site density changing. We have the lower, this is lower latitude, higher latitude, how it's changing. I have things uh, shown it's clearly in the last picture. And here maybe a more interesting to see this artifact. This is the uh, stone tools uh, around the uh, transition stage from early to middle Pleistocene. We can see in North China, we have these uh, innovations of very uh, nice small tools, well retouched, uh, clear type with clear typology. And in South China, we have seen the arrays of the large carton tools. People call this kind of things uh, excavated from Bursa. I think it's uh, published in 2008 in science, called it Ashurin uh, like tools. So, anyway, we, we do not, uh, here we do not want to dis discuss a lot how to call it, call it Ashurin or by face or call large carton tools. Anyway, we have this kind of innovation in South China. It's maybe local, maybe from outside, but with something new appearing, uh, appeared at this stage. So large uh, enriched uh, the archeological evidence uh, in China and gave the different faces uh, from the North and the South. Why the large part in tools develop only in South China, not crossed to the high latitude in Nihon Basin. It's only because of the raw materials, maybe because we do not have large blocks in Nihon. I don't think so. It must have some ecological reasons. There's no use maybe for these large cartridge tools. Okay, from now, uh, from, yeah. I think in the uh, first part, I have give you a general uh, review of the work we have been done in the recent years on early and the middle Pleistocene states of Nihon Basin. Uh, some we nowadays we are doing some uh, uh, late Pleistocene uh, works. Uh, I hope uh, I can share with you next time. Um, it's very funny. Also, the late Pleistocene they have a lot of new things that we haven't known before. So by now, as the we haven't finished the late Pleistocene in Nihon Basin, so I would like to share you some other uh, shared work uh, from Northeast China to know the late Pleistocene and early Holocene. So this is another project uh, begins 2014. 
uh, as we begin the excavations uh, together with the Heilongjiang Provincial Institute of Cultural Relics and Archaeology in 2013. And then in the coming year, 2014, we begin to this uh, research cooperations. It's till now. And uh, here you can find a younger me. I think it's 2014 when the second year so we're doing the excavation in Taoshan site. And why Northeast China is so attractive for me because uh, maybe you have you have already known Sinihua when I have so rich archaeology. Why I also choose Northeast East China as my study target? It's a it's a uh, it's very important crossroad uh, for the Siberia and the uh, Far East Russia, uh, Korean. Uh, and also North China. It's like a crossroad. Also, if you link it to more east, then it's uh, also the also goes through to the North American. It's very another. In, it's maybe another interesting story. And also because the environmental and uh, the ecological background in Northeast China is very different. They have the plant. They also have some mountain areas, uh, have a very thick forest. This ecological background uh, gives uh, clear distinguished from the uh, North China plan. So it's good to check uh, both of them at the same time to see how hunter gatherers uh, adapted to the different uh, habitats. So when I came to the Northeast China, I bring some questions because this area also have the big fauna. And we all already know that in North American, people telling the story between the fauna, a large fauna like mammoths, like uh, uh, between them and the humans, whether the similar things that happened in Northeast China the uh, weather distinctions, uh, extinctions of this large mammal related to the hunter-gathered in the area, the population growing and the hunted more mammals, and uh, whether there's a cultural discontinuities during the LGN, and how new lizations uh, happen in this mountain area, because this is the mountain area by the archaeological uh, evidence we have now, there's no agriculture until so 5,000 years ago, because 5,000 BP in China, we are in the in the central China, we are already going to the Bronze Age, but in Northeast China, they are still hunter gather. This is the uh, location of the Taoshan site. We excavated, uh, okay, here you can see the date, the, the exactly date of the excavations and also a younger me here. So this is the excavation we're doing. We're doing Taoshan site. It's at the entrance of the Xiaoxinanli mountain. So this is the site. I, for me, I have worked my whole PhD in the, for the middle Pleistone Sea and early Pleistone Sea. I'm very surprised to say something so young. This is the youngest site I have ever been worked on, but it's very interesting and very attractive for me. Just the clear change of the from stratigraphic to, from one layer to the other layer, the color already told you the climate background clearly. And what is also interesting, I did a small work, small like a project for the raw materials because I'm surprised to say from layer to layer, the linguistic color change, okay, the raw materials change to working out why and what kind of raw, what kind of raw material they are applying and why they changed the raw materials. So we do some very geological work and uh, to identify the, some artifact. Yes, we can do this kind of identify, uh, identifications by looking at uh, artifacts directly, but sometimes uh, some kind of rock are hard to identify by only seeing it. So we also doing some C sections to identify. 
like this kind of vitric because at the beginning we think it is a church it or a flint think this is flint but uh, later it's a kind of tube just so what is more interesting is to see this when the type of the raw materials are changing through the whole layer and the, when we're doing the pollen the vegetation changed when the uh, when it is grassland people use the two when the four is growing up the uh the percentage of the to uh, vitrin to this kind of white raw materials declined very clearly. Here we even cannot see it. It's in very low percentage. But the, all the other kind of things begin to use. So at this time in 2017, we I just uh, tell the story of the raw materials. How uh, how the raw materials uh, raw materials uh, uh, strategy uh, so <coughs> from the uh, from different uh, layers changes and later in two thousand nineteen with Dr. Yu Jianping uh, who worked in our teams uh, for his uh, PhD but now he moved to another in, uh, university we found uh, the sister site for Taoshan here is Taoshan here is Huayang. They are like sister uh, sites because uh, it's it's uh, we can see the same situation. The color of the soil change, which can sometimes we are joking. We do not need to date in the layer from the color. You can know the general times uh, time scale how it's changing from the layer to layer. This is a very large scale excavation by the institute because of building up of this uh, uh, high speed road. So they they hope they do work very quickly. So they did a very large excavation. Also, we did some story. We have some story of the Rome Tourists, but different from Taoshan because this site is very clear, uh, close to the outcrops of the uh, of the Rome Tourists. So they use the local raw material, and, uh, but the interesting thing is they choose a different raw material to do different kind of uh, linguistics, very different from Taoshan site. Taoshan site, uh, they do not have very clear uh, uh, reduction sequence for different kind of uh, raw materials. But this site, when they are this site, when they are very close to the raw materials, they have. Uh, Different. Uh, they use a different uh, kind of uh, raw material doing different kind of linking. So also this is uh, like napping site. You can say the similar kind of raw material clustered in one areas. They are very like here is the only the banded uh, things. Here is uh, another kind of tooth, and they are and uh, they use chert only here. So we build after reduction sequence for different kind of raw materials. They are into different kind of linseed products. So this story is, uh, is uh, built up. Raw material story is built for a uh, built it up at the Huayang uh, site. After we did the work with these two sites, we also do some more investigations uh, and check about the other people's excavations. In the whole northeast Asia and uh, whole northeast northeast China, and we got uh, very surprised to find uh, some um, uh, interesting things to share with you, like uh, how different kind of different areas use different uh, kind of raw materials and how the uh, microblade reduction technology is changing through the time. Also, we find out the transition between the new uh, paleolithic to the neolithic in this area. Uh, one thing I should mention earlier is that we have a portrait, uh, pottery evidence in the both Huayang site and uh, Huayang and uh, Taoshan site. It's appeared at the very black layers 
uh, can, uh, maybe you have, uh, you still remember the, uh, the stratigraphy. The, we have the very dark layers. It's a very warm stage, the BA stage. They have the pottery appeared at this stage and also have the pottery grounded stone tools. This is the, we call it the transition from the Paleolithic to Neolithic. All, all, uh, all those years, no agriculture appeared, but we can see the life we and the, uh, uh, the cultural material changed. When we're talking about the northeast uh, East China and talk the whole area about the Siberia and uh, northeastern Asia, one thing we should mention is the microblade technology. In fact, uh, based on the research week work we have done uh, in the past uh, five years, we have found that the microblade technology became the standardized after the LGN and uh, maybe it happened in some north northeast China sites like Helong Dadong and uh, uh, Fengling site. So this is what we published about the new live visions uh, about uh, this area because these mountain areas, the knowledge we got about these big transitions uh, uh, happened in the mountain areas is very different from the, what we have about the uh, North China plan. So it's also new for me when I, when I work out this. And also here we compared a lot of the uh, microblade cause uh, we got to this, the changing of the technology. Finally, we got a very nice uh, uh, two side, we touched the uh, pre uh, two side prepared uh, microblade call and it's uh, got widely spread in North China, Northeast China, and perhaps also the, also uh, <coughs> dispersed back to the, uh, to the Siberia areas. I, we have some comments back about our this research work. I think they comment us uh, in the journal, in the same journal uh, later of this year. They think there is some earlier site in the Koreans. Maybe uh, we have, uh, we, uh, maybe the uh, Northern Microblade industry, not from North China, North East China, maybe from Korean, but to, to see the uh, bigger pictures, in fact, this is the same, same areas. And uh, uh, we got, Recent years excavation did by our uh, the local archaeologists uh, from Jilin province. Uh, they already gave good database about the this kind of uh, developed microblade industry. And the the other uh, this is like uh, the plan for the future. I'm happy to find that uh, because uh, before we never considered how the bridge between the Northeast Asia to North Americans uh, are working on, how, how it's work out, how people get through uh, Northeast Asia into America. The timing and uh, the, uh, the roots of the people in America is still a very hot topic for the archaeology. So this is a comparison. I have, uh, have no, we have seen that uh, the uh, scholars from American and uh, from Europe have already do some models about the root of uh, how people in the American, but uh, it's a little bit pity that uh, this area is uh, blank for a long time. Now we are trying to do more work to reaching, uh, to enrich the evidence from Northeast, uh, Northeastern Asia. And then maybe in the next step, we can get uh, a more uh, clearly uh, dispersal route into the uh, North American. I think it's a long time attractive uh, archaeological questions uh, for international scholars. 
So in the next step, we also hope to get cooperation on this work. And uh, we also happy to call in the uh, climate uh, people working on the paleo climate uh, and uh, uh, paleo environment to remodel uh, how the people getting through the land bridge into America. So thanks, this is all what I want to share today. I think I get a quite long time for answering your question. Thank you very much. Um, that was an excellent talk and yeah, very, very interesting to see some some of the work that you're doing coming out of China. Um, if you would like to stop sharing your screen, we'll then go into the Q&A. Mm -hmm. Okay, I stop my sharing. Yeah, if you stop sharing, then we will do the Q&A. Okay. okay, brilliant. Um, so just a reminder, if you have a question, you can either raise your hand um, or you can put your question in the chat. Um, so we do already have one question from the chat. So Walter has asked, what human remains, if any, have you found at your study site? <clears throat> Sorry. And if you, um, if yes, what inferences have you proposed about these human remains? Uh, would you like me to repeat? What is the question? What is, uh, human remains? Yes. Mm. It's a pity. I have uh, excavated in Northeast Asia, it, uh, Northeast China. Uh, it's a very bad, uh, 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 like uh, no bones remains uh, have been found, even for the fauna, because this area is with a lot of rainfall and it's the forest areas. So it's not a good uh, uh, place to find out the bones. I also work for Dingsun site excavations during my PhD. Uh, there have found uh, homo bombs in 1950s, but there's no ones now. We're trying hard to hunting more fossils uh, to get uh, who is the owner of the lynxics, but uh, uh, not always so lucky to find the bombs. Sure. Um, thank you. Um, does anybody else have a question? Um, Doug, if you'd like to go next. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much for a really interesting talk. Um, I just wanted to um, take you to the end of the periods that you were talking about and, and ask what in, in that area in northeastern China where you've excavated some sites, what's the earliest evidence for cultivated or domestic millet um, in those areas, you know, in relation to your discussion of the appearance of the Neolithic? Uh, my, uh, my colleagues who are working on the ancient plant and agriculture, it's very interesting this question too. I have uh, uh, transported a lot of soy back to Beijing for them to have the hope to find some uh, evidence of, of agriculture, but sorry, we have nothing until to 5,000 years BP. So we think it's very developed hunter-gatherer in these uh, forest areas, but maybe in the plantal area you can find some. It's hard to find in the mountain areas. You think that's partly a problem of um, preservation on the site? So do you think that's a, a very real very late appearance of, of cultivation. I think maybe this is the uh, one reason because similar uh, same to the uh, fossils, it's the it's the preservation problem of this kind of soil, the black soil of northeast China, but also maybe because of the, it's not a good area for agriculture, mm. and the forest is rich for the people to get food and animals. Great, thank you very much, very interesting. Um, thank you, Doug. Um, I think Wayne, did you have your hand up? 
<laughs> I, I see that uh, a question on the homo longji. It's uh, homo long, I think we call it uh, long ren, uh, human long. They, they give this name because it's, uh, it was told the fossil is uh, uh, recovered from Heilongjiang, the province I'm working on, so it takes the name Long. And the uh, dragon is also a symbol, uh, symbols for Chinese people. So they take this for the special fossil. Uh, for this fossil, it's uh, definitely very important. Uh, we can see how archaic it's looking like. Uh, but uh, without archaeological background, it's really very hard to comment who are they or what they are related to. So really hope in the future uh, field work or field excavation or investigation, we can find the background of the new species. But uh, what if this new species remind me is my PhD work about the Ashurans in the in Dinsun. We also have some large carton tools in Northeast China, but not so far in Liaoning province where it's connected to the Korean. Because in Korean, we also have some evidence of the bifaces. So this, whether these uh, harmonians, uh, these new fossils, new species is related to the uh, bifacial, uh, 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 bifacial tools or assurance, uh, it's my own questions. I want to work out this. They may be a uh, good uh, owners for this kind of uh, technique. Thank you. Yes, it's uh, very interesting. Um, I think Wayne has a question. Yeah, I, sorry, I couldn't figure out how to turn off my mute for a second. Um, you had a, in one of the images, it said earliest dining table found in China. Does that mean you've actually found um, what appear to be, I say settlement sites, I don't mean as in town, but as in places where people were actually living as compared to, uh, you know, just a, an industrial site? Sorry, can you repeat? Because it's not a... Uh... Uh, you, you, the um, dining table in the uh, one image. Um, have you actually found settlement, in other words, living sites, as compared to industrial sites, or can you tell uh, currently? Dining sites? Ah, uh, you mean the old, uh, the oldest sites? Yeah, the, the, the housing sites as compared to the um, places where they're, you know, uh, getting the uh, lithic material and making the uh, tools, you know, where mm -hmm. they lived as compared to where they made them. Uh, can, can you tell right now whether you, the sites you found are industrial sites where they were just making tools or whether they were living sites as well? Um, I think Taoshan site is more like living site. The Huayang site is more like linseed napping site. It's a different kind of site. And uh, also in Huayang site, different culture layers, people use it in different uh, like functions. Uh, like in the upper layers around the 5,000 years, they have some houses, like the host for the, like uh, uh, for the tent, the, uh, the host, how to say that? The, like for the uh, housing base, in the uh, in the layers uh, about five thousand years, but for the older site we cannot for like living surface, pearls or anything. No. Okay. Thank you very much, Wayne. Thank you very much. So we have a question in the chat um, concerning lithic technology of early Paleolithic. Are there any special characteristics um, tools different from other known? in Paleolithic sites of Africa and Europe? Uh, thank you for this question. This is uh, what I really like my, my personal interest in because now I have projects in different parts and different uh, time period. But for my own like interest is about the early tools. Uh, we have the Shangchen site published in 2018 with the age of uh, 2 million years, 2.1 2 million years. 
uh, I compare the tools uh, with some Africa audio audio site. It's very similar, but uh, like uh, in the early at uh, the transition about the early to the middle Pleistocene, say around uh, one uh, million years, there's a uh, very uh, some uh, very like developed. Uh, Small tools. Some can be uh, it may it can be put into the middle uh, middle Paleolithic. So if I, I got some of the tools and put it in the middle uh, middle Paleolithic assemblage, people can now to distinguish it. So it's very surprised. Uh, like uh, there is a like a, a kind of uh, discussion of people think that. Uh, China, in China, in North, uh, in uh, Eastern Asia, people keep this kind of uh, cough lake uh, traditions and developed uh, well developed uh, small tools. So they spend uh, more time to retouching and uh, the flake to get uh, uh, small tools. Okay, thank you. We've got another question in the chat from um, RJ. What exactly are the environmental changes in the Niwan uh, Basin at terminal Pleistocene? Environmental changes, exactly. This is a, um, this is a, a work we are doing now with the Institute of Geological and Ge uh, Geophysics because um, the problem is that uh, you can see most of my research work, I'm using the global climate background uh, as uh, the exactly sequences on the long lacrystrians deposit haven't uh, finished yet. So we're still doing very, uh, uh, very high resolutions, uh, uh, high solutions, uh, researches on the environmental background exactly in the basin. I think after we finish this kind of studies, we will have more exactly climate background for the Inhoan Basin. It's a good place to kick off this kind of work. Okay, thank you. Um, so we do have some more time if there are any more questions. If not, we can finish a bit early as I know it's uh, quite late for you. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I'm like, it. I'm a young person, but very living in a very, <laughs> very old uh, way. I sleep early. So at the, at the second part of my talk, I get sleeping. Right. It's, uh, sorry, because it's already like 10 for me. Very, very happy to share with uh, all of you and uh, like uh, it's felt uh, for me like a long time not speaking long time in English. Sorry, no, no, you did excellent. Hope you can understand in my talk. <laughs> no, it was absolutely excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, we will call it a day there. Um, we'll let you get off, get off home. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, and thank you again um, for the brilliant talk. Um, we have another seminar next week with um, Professor Andrea Manica from the University of Cambridge. Um, so that'll be um, excellent as well. Um, but yes, thank you very much and um, see you all again soon. Yeah, if, if it's uh, on a good time, I think not in midnight for me, I will in your seminars because I stopped the traveling for this year. I'm <laughs> always in Beijing from this week. Sure. Okay, thanks again. Thank you for sharing. Yes, thank you very much. Right, bye. Bye.